Let me just take a moment to introduce our panelists. Um, I'll, I'll do that very briefly and not to the extent that they deserve. Um, I think I was counting, and I believe there's about 100 years or so of expertise sitting up on the stage with me. I'm not going to tell you how it's distributed among them, but uh, there's a whole lot of knowledge, and I'm honored to be here uh, with General George Flynn, the commander of Marine Corps Combat Development Command, uh, graduate of the Naval Academy, commanded at all kinds of different uh, units, including multiple assignments in training and education for the Marine Corps uh, at Special Operations Command, the Deputy Commanding General in Iraq, um, and I think um, now largely responsible for the thinkers and innovators as well as the fighters, um, and a little bit of penny pinching and whatever the other one was as well down at McCidic. Um to his right is Dakota Wood, a senior fellow at the Center for Strategic and Budgetary Assessments, uh, retired Marine Lieutenant Colonel, uh, also a big thinker who has worked in uh, Office of Net Assessment, among other places, and a uh, sort of outside of the box uh, thinker on a lot of Marine Corps issues. And to my left is um, Creighton Green, a 20 year professional staff member on the Senate Armed Services Committee responsible for aviation accounts, for Navy ship, shipbuilding accounts, uh, intelligence accounts, and uh, I think the rest of the defense budget as well. Uh, <laughs> just about everything. He's um, the lone representative of the Army as an Army reservist, um, retired Army reservist. And so we've got the ground forces represented up here. And uh, prior to that, spent some time at, at the Office of Management and Budget as well. So. Uh, again, a great deal of expertise, and we're looking forward to your reflections on what theater access might mean. Um, some of the, I believe you got a number of questions kicked to you by our uh, secretary of work, so maybe you can take the rest of our time talking about those, and the, the other two can kibitz a little. So we'll start with you. And oh, first of all, I, I was the individual that secretary of work was referring to. Uh, throughout his talk as the one who should answer your questions. <laughs> so uh, I, I will be one of the leaders of the Force Structure Review Group. I am responsible for developing the ground combat tactical vehicle strategy. And I think there's a couple other things that I'm supposed to be doing. But as I, as I uh, prepared for this panel today, and I read the letter I, um, of invitation, it said, uh, I took away my understanding is that the basic question was being asked is why a Marine Corps? And uh, I think that's what we were, we were circling around try, trying to answer today. And I think that can be found in a, in a number of places. We talked about Iraq and Afghanistan, you know, just what the Marine Corps has been doing since 2001. But that should never be what defines the Marine Corps. That is just one aspect of what we bring to the table. How many of you realize in the room that this past month over, we've had over about 20,000 Marines in Afghanistan, but we had 10,000 Marines at sea? I mean, how many people realize that we never gave away the sea-based mission when we've been talking about being this second land-based army? It's part of doing windows. It's part of being adaptable and flexible, and that is what we do. So what have we been doing since 2001? Well, you know we've been in Iraq and Afghanistan. You know we've been, been fighting the counterinsurgency fight. But we've also been engaged in numerous places around the world. Uh, we've been uh, doing Afri Africa partnership stations. We've been out there uh, engaged in the Pacific doing numerous operations with our friends and allies. We've been in uh, Latin America doing the same things. Uh, we've responded to crisis. Uh, we evacuated 14,000 American citizens from Lebanon from, uh, from uh, operating from the sea. We also did an evacuation in uh, Liberia. Right? That was all also with the same force that, again, was at, from time to time being deployed to Iran, to Iraq and uh, Afghanistan. Uh, other, other issues, humanitarian assistance, the disaster relief. We played a significant role in the, in the uh, response recently to Haiti. But what force was that done with? Well, it was done with an expeditionary unit that had just returned from combat and was on its, uh, its uh, post-deployment leave and was re-aggregated and sent to Haiti. That was augmented by the expeditionary unit that was on its way to combat. And it was augmented by another ship that was going to do an Africa partnership uh, station. So here you have uh, a multi-purpose force that has really proven its utility. And we also did power projection. Task Force 58 was, uh, was uh, 
was talked about. That was doing power projection from a sea base 400 miles inland. Right? People used to say during the Gulf War that we would never go 400 miles inland from a sea base. Guess what? We did. And we did it well. Uh, the majority of these, again, are being done from a sea base, and they're being done with that same multi-purpose force that clearly, clearly is multi-capable. If you want to know why a Marine Corps, I guess uh, Mr. Work brought it up, you need to read the book First to Fight, because we truly are those, those people that uh, he talks about. We are, in fact, the thinkers. You may not think we are. We are the innovators. You may not think we innovate. We are the improvisers. We are penny pinchers. And Mr. Work, we never steal anything from the Army. It's borrowed. So, <laughs> so you, we'll, we'll give that back. And we truly are the fighters. But this is more than the Marine mystique, all right? And you'll never understand the Marine mystique unless you are a Marine. But uh, this is what we are. So the thinkers, uh, are we thinking now? I, I like to think that we are. Uh, we just published our Marine Corps operating concepts. We just worked with the Navy and published the Naval operating concepts. And tell me that's not thinking about the future if you've taken the time to read that. Innovation in terms of equipment. Uh, you know, we're thinking and we're getting real close now to deploying a cargo UAS. Uh, on, the, on the lower end, we like dogs. Uh, we're being innovative in the deployment of dogs. Our IED detector dogs are some of the best sensors out there to find IEDs. You know, that was an innovative program that started in our warfighting lab and is now adding capability to our forces. The MV-22, people said it wouldn't make a difference. It's making a tremendous difference on the battlefield. Enhanced MAGTAF operations, which have a, has their origins, enhanced company operations, where we have young platoon commanders now that operate 40 to 50 miles away from their company headquarters. All right, that is innovative. And what does that mean? We're doing uh, company-level intel and company-level operations. But what does that mean to the expeditionary force as a whole? Working with the Navy, the maritime preposition force, that has just been changed by the addition of the TAKE and the MLP. Who would have thought that this past January we could do at sea transfer 300 miles off the coast of Tampa, Tampa multiple times, an M1 tank from a large ship to a smaller ship that we could land uh, via connector to the, the base. That is, that is the spirit of innovation and conceptualizing. We're also thinking about the future. And, we are think and part of that is you need to know what the future is going to look like. And we do understand that the future that we face is going to be complex and it's going to be uncertain. General Scales once said that we're never going to get the future 100% right. We just can't afford to be 100% wrong. And we are looking around the corner. We're trying to figure out what is going to be the surprise and we're trying to prevent that. So we know that we're going to have to be improvising because the enemy we face uh, is, is going to be empowered by the democratization of technology. You know, it's going to be complicated by state and non-state actors that are going to require at the low end of conflict the same capabilities that we would require at the high end of capability to protect our interests around the globe wherever they may be threatened. Uh, and again, I would tell you that we, we also have to do this, and this is where the penny pension comes in. We're going to have to do this in a fiscally challenged environment or a fiscally informed environment. And I'm not a programmer at heart, so please don't ask me any budget questions. <laughs> All right, I'm the fighter, okay? So based on all the above, where do the fighters come in in all of this? Well, for the Marine Corps to be relevant, we must bring to the Joint Warfighting, uh, wa wa joint warfighter Toolkit the following. We must have the ability to engage, to conduct combat operations, to do security, and to do relief and reconstruction. All right, where did I get that from? That comes from the capstone concept for joint operations. It tells, that is the guidance that I've been given as the force developer to create a force that can do all of that and can transition easily to it. The good news is your Marines are doing it right now. We are fighting the three block war and we are living in the neighborhood, all right, at the same time. We have young, young, uh, young Marines out there who are engaged in combat, they're training their replacements, the, secure, the local security forces, and they're enabling the, the government to take place. Okay, accordingly then, I see that the two key roles of the Marine Corps in the future is to be a sea-based crisis response force, if you will, the nation's 911 force. That is what we've traditionally been called upon to do since the end of World War II. That should be how we're trying to define the Marine Corps, and it should be as a sea-based force. We in the Marine Corps, working with the Navy, you know, use the sea as maneuver space. 
the sea gives us maneuver capability. It gives us the ability to go where people do not expect us to come from. The sea is also our operating base. We would like to keep as many of our war fighting functions at sea to minimize our force protection requirements ashore. So we are very comfortable with thinking about the future and thinking what we're going to have to do. And we're going to be able to do that uh, by being that the, the nation's 911 force. We're going to be the force that enables joint access. And I'm, I think Mr. Work covered that pretty well. Is that's what we do, is we're an enabling force for joint action. And when you think about the Marine Corps, think that we're unique, unique among all the services only because we don't own a single domain. All right? We operate across multiple domains, but we're not the domain dominators. Uh, we don't dominate a specific domain, but we're specifically task organized to be that engagement, that response force, and that force that assists in prevailing to be a contributor to each of those domains. But what we do in our crisis response role and in our engagement role is that we uh, enable the other uh, leaders of the domains to take hold. So I'd summarize this by saying the nation's force that will engage all the time right, to be forward presence from a sea base. And by engagement, you prevent conflict. And I'll tell you, it's a lot cheaper if you prevent conflict than having to fight conflict. So think of the Marine Corps as your engagement force from the sea base. Globally deployed, making friends, creating those relationships that will ena enable access in a time of crisis. We'll be the response force. When American interests need to be defended or citizens defended, we'll be forward deployed and forward positioned to provide that. And when we need to prevail in conflict, we'll be the force that projects power that enables the joint force to have the access they need to accomplish the mission. And all of this will be based on one core fact, that the strength of the Marine Corps will, will remain uh, the strength of the individual Marine and the capability that it brings to the fight. And that's it. Uh, thanks to Dr. Hamry. I don't believe he's here for getting this thing started in the series and, and for you, Dr. Weep, for allowing me to participate. Uh, also, thanks to my fellow panelists for allowing me to, to join their number, and I look forward to their insights uh, and the conversation we'll have. Uh, I'd just like to tee up a, a short list of issues for a consideration that I think will impact the Marine Corps in, in fairly profound ways in the next uh, several years. Uh, to start with, and, and Mr. Work has, has already addressed several of these, the growing weight of uh, Marine Corps units. Uh, in my view, the very limited number of amphibious ships available with which to conduct operations, uh, spiraling cost of major acquisition programs, the escalating cost of uh, manpower, uh, especially considering the cost of the all-volunteer force and what that implies in future years, uh, an out-of-control federal deficit, uh, which I'm sure Mr. Green will be able to talk to uh, more authoritatively, uh, a flat national economy with a strong potential for continued uh, perturbations and difficulties in the years ahead, uh, lean future defense budgets uh, that can't help but emerge from the preceding two issues, and the impact of a decade of continuous combat operations on both personnel uh, and equipment. I have little doubt that, that, that many, if not all, of these will come up in a question and answer session. I'll be interested to hear uh, your comments and observations as well as those of my fellow panelists. With regard to <coughs> warfare, the current Corps, the Marine Corps, is the most combat experienced Marine Corps since Vietnam. With regard to lean budgets, however, the current Corps is the least experienced Marine Corps since probably the Carter years. And there's a huge disconnect between those two that, that the Marine Corps uh, is currently grappling with. I find it interesting to note also that, that the vast majority of Marines now serving have known nothing but ample resources and sustained operations ashore. And only the most senior and experienced Marines, such as General Flynn uh, next to me here, have known otherwise. And it really it falls to, uh, to these very senior individuals who've known other times uh, to assess the implications for the service uh, and, to, and to guide its efforts to, to reconcile that. Uh, the great challenge then for the Marine Corps today is to reconcile these conflicting issues so the service is prepared institutionally, uh, operationally, conceptually, organizationally, and especially financially uh, for the next decade or two to come. Uh, I think that currently there's a substantial gulf between the Corps envisioned and the service's conceptual documents, which I think are very good. Uh, Vince Goulding and, and uh, Doug King, working for General Flynn, have done some phenomenal work with 
enhanced maneuver warfare, enhanced company operations, bank type operations, et cetera. And, but there's a disconnect between the core and vision in those documents, the core that the service is pursuing programmatically, and the core that it's likely feasible in the uh, future year defense program. At great risk of being overly dramatic, but I just couldn't help it, uh, I, it came to mind uh, Dickens' classic opening line in A Tale of Two Cities, it was the best of times and it was the worst of times. <clears throat> but in that opening line, he goes on to say it was the age of wisdom, it was the age of foolishness, uh, it was the spring of hope, and it was the winter of despair. And I'm afraid that in, in many areas these days across the services, uh, in the Defense Department, we're seeing too much of the latter in these couplets and not, and not enough of the former. Uh, for the core, it truly is the best of times and the worst of times. It's arguably, as, as Mr. Work has already said, at its very best in uh, tactical excellence and combat experience and in operational maturity. But it's also encumbered by a program that I believe is fiscally untenable. Uh, it has a sister service whose priorities seem to lie everywhere but in amphibious warfare. And it, there's a very real possibility that the service will see a retrenchment in in strength to pre-9-11 uh, numbers, if not very much lower. Uh, I think that the incoming Commandant General Amos is, certainly uh, has work cut out for him, uh, but I think it's also been a very long time since the Corps has had such a, a capable team at the most senior levels as it currently has, and, and they will be able to support the Commandant in dealing with these uh, challenges. So I wish him the very best of luck and have the highest hopes for their success. Uh, again, thanks for this opportunity, and I look forward to listening to General Flynn answer all the questions <laughs> that will come his way. I think you just laid a few more on the table for him, too. Exactly. Um, Crane, if you want to talk about the congressional perspective on some of these issues, that'd be great. Well, <clears throat> first of all, I have to issue a disclaimer. Uh, I don't speak for the committee. I don't speak for any of the senators. And I barely speak for myself on most occasions. So yeah. let, me, uh, let me qualify this as just my own personal views on things. Um, I think one of the things that, you know, the Congress provides, and I'm not the first to use this metaphor, but uh, Congress is sort of the board of directors. And they've watched relative changes in emphasis within the department, within different administrations. I think you know, you're all well familiar with the current emphasis on uh, cyber warfare, changes of the, the executive branch to accommodate soft power, the, a, a term not un, uncommon to all of you, I'm sure. Um, focus on irregular warfare. Um, and focusing on anti-access capabilities of potential foes. Uh, we run the risk sometimes of, of veering from side to side in the road in search of the latest um, term of art relative to emphases within the national security establishment. I recall with some pain um, the late 70s when the department and the administration were focused on NATO. We ended up with a pre-positioned brigade in Norway that some of you are familiar with. Uh, now, while I'm sure that scared the hell out of the Warsaw Pact, a, a brigade in NATO, um, it's not clear that it had a lot of, it, and it certainly provided su support and comfort to our allies in NATO. I'm not sure that it would have had a sort of a uh, definitive impact on the land campaign and the full the gap. I also remember during those times worrying about torturing every piece of analysis to show how every dollar within the Navy, Army, Air Force budget contributed to NATO. Um, those, uh, those times were not, uh, not particularly pleasant um, and I hope that we don't once again lose our focus on what are the sort of the continuing precepts upon which we buy a Department of the Navy or a Marine Corps. And frankly, I think the, the general view among the Board of Directors, as I've been able to observe it, is that um, if we didn't have a Marine Corps, we'd have to invent one. So if you're talking about sort of the longer term view on things, um, the sort of the existential threat to a Marine Corps, frankly, I don't see it being there. Um, what probably is, um, is lost on many people, but is not lost on members. Members typically, we have some new members on the committee, we have new members in the Senate and the House all the time, but a lot of the members have been around a long time. And they take, they take a different, slightly different perspective. Some of our senior members on the committee 
have actually been around since those days of the sort of the pre uh, predominant uh, preoccupation with whether it can whether a defense dollar contributed to NATO or not. Um, Senator Levin, who's chairman of the committee, but came to the Senate during the late 70s, for instance. But I think, you know, the, the fact that many of them have been around for a while gives them the opportunity to develop a longer, longer perspective. They don't have to worry about being commandant or CNO or chief of staff of the Army to make a difference in their four or six year tenure, as the case may be. So while they, um, they are influenced by political environment and the financial environment, which we find ourselves in, um, they remember, or they remember enough of history to remember that we, we started out worrying about pirates. We're still worrying about pirates. Some things continue. We started out worrying about turmoil in Latin America. We still are worried about turmoil in Latin America. We started out worrying about trade security. Um, if you remember, uh, we had uh, some of our ships stopped under a little unpleasantness in 1812, it led up to 1812. Um, we still have concerns about trade security, trade access. So the, the, I think you need to think of Congress as look, tr typically, while there may be uh, individual uh, battles over EFV or V-22, um, for those of you who don't remember, Congress kept that program alive when the administration wanted to kill it. You probably don't remember that, do you? Yeah. Not? Okay. Um, tough audience. Sorry. Um, well, let me tell you, just as a former Army officer, we did not uh, appreciate the scrounging. Um, um, okay, that, okay. That, um, but, but the, the, you know, they're, they're, the, the, the members are typically going to take a longer term view of this, of this, of any particular situation. They saw in the early 90s that the Marine Corps needed to modernize its medium lift fleet. Uh, they didn't see a particular, uh, attra particularly attractive alternative otherwise, uh, d despite a COEA that said um, you know, it's only marginally better. Uh, they didn't take that view. For, the, for those of you, you remember what COEAs are, the cost and operational effectiveness analysis, the AOAs of their days. Um, so the, the Congress is typically, I think, going to take a longer term view. I think the, the, the issue du jour is whether or not, as, as was raised by a question, uh, about EFV. What are we going to do about EFV? Well, I'm, Congress hasn't been asked to take any position on EFV other than support the restructure of the program after the Nunn McCurdy. Congress supported that restructuring and continues. Uh, Congress hasn't been presented with an alternative which may be, port, uh, may be portended or foretold perhaps by some of Secretary Gates' comments about um, EFV and how expensive it is. So I think you know, the members of Congress are going to make a decision or come to a conclusion based on whatever analysis is put forward that you all can get past the Secretary of Defense. Um, and so I think uh, that's sort of the, the, the perspective on which Congress is going to typically view things. Uh, the budget situation, uh, Congress has been very um, forthcoming with resources and, and will, be so, will be that way anytime troops are in the field engaged in combat. I don't think they, any member of Congress wants to be seen as shorting what the troops need. In fact, I think the, you, if you look at history of uh, recent years, you'd find that Congress has leaned farther forward than the Department of Defense on things like body armor, uh, MRAPs, and other pieces of equipment to get into theater. I think um, some members were very frustrated by that and insisted that the department move faster than uh, the department was inclined to move. In fact, uh, normally you talk about the acquisition rules that, department inflict, that Congress inflicts on the department, Congress was only too happy to waive normal acquisition procedures when it came to fielding the MRAP vehicles, for instance, because they didn't want to see more kids dying because they were in thin-skinned Humvees. Nevertheless, we are faced with uh, trillion-dollar deficits, and at some point, um, just as in the mid-'80s, the, the deficit hawks will probably prevail over the defense hawks. 
and there will be a re restraining, maybe not cuts, but certainly not the kind of growth we've seen over the last uh, 10 years. And so that is an environment in which we will have to operate uh, both on a, from our end of the street as well as from your end of the street. So resources will not be unlimited. And there will be tough choices that will have to be made, and uh, I think most of the members look forward to engaging with that. I think there were some, when Secretary Gates made his, state, state, his speech at the Naval League, a number of members were upset about that. But I think another, another group of more thoughtful members said, well, let's, you know, let's have that discussion about what's important for the Navy and the Marine Corps and the Department for the next 10, 20 years. I mean, it was, it was the, the Congress that insisted on a QDR that's supposed to look 20 years out. Now, we, the independent panel, I think, rightly points out that there's no, uh, there are some limitations in that process. But Congress really wants the department to focus on the longer term rather than to, to make uh, sort of short-term budget related uh, decisions that are maybe uh, penny-wise and pound-foolish in the long term. And I think that's probably, I need, okay. I've, I've filibustered long enough to keep up my, uh, my end of the stick here and um, I should probably stop there. Uh, thank you very much. Let me just start by asking one quick question before we open it up to the group. Um, I wanted to ask you, General, about Dakota's proposition about the mismatch between uh, the concepts, the program, and the likely available resources. Um, and then I also wanted to get Creighton's take on as the Marine Corps and the Department of the Navy and the Department of Defense try to address uh, a proposition that I think is, from, in, my, in my observation, is defensible, uh, how likely is Congress's answer to be congruent with uh, the types of solutions that, that the department has to come up with? Okay, with regard to the, the concepts and programs, I, I think uh, the concepts are being, are being designed to deal with the an environment that's going to be full of uncertainty in the future. But they're also going to be informed by, by fiscal reality. And when I, what I tell people lately is that you can have anything you want, you just can't have everything. And we're going to have to figure out how to make those choices. Now part of that uh, making that choice is, is to take a look at the requirements. We, we already talked about uh, lightning, the, the Marine Air Ground Task Force. You know, one of the initial products of the ground uh, combat vehicle strategy is we're going to reduce the number of vehicles uh, by 10,000 in the Marine Corps. We're going to go from 42,000 vehicles to about 32,000 vehicles. Uh, and we're going to do that over, over the next three years. All right. The other part of that is we need to take a look at our requirements. You know, right now, if you, if you want to build something, is the requirement right? Or can you take risk in that requirement, for example, and still have the same requirement, but defer, you know, whether you add the capability and leave, and leave the room for growth in the vehicle has a means of addressing that. Because we do believe that the fiscal challenges are real and that we're going to have to be able to do that. But that's not going to stop our con conceptual thinking. What we're going to be able to do then is, and, and I think this is the tasking we have from the department, is, is to, there's no objection, I think, to our concept. Now it's how do you make that concept affordable? And we have to come up with the choices to present to the leadership to decide, you know, how are we go how are we going to do that? But we're not sitting idly. We are going to get lighter. We are going to do that by re by reducing numbers of vehicles, for example. The energy initiatives you talked about make you lighter. Uh, they save you money. And and if we're allowed to reinvest that money, a lot of this programmatic uh, challenges uh, get minimized in some way, or they get mitigated. Uh, they may not go away, but there is some mitigation involved. So. We are, we are thinking hard and we are listening to the guidance that we're, we're getting from our, from our leadership. Uh, Creighton, you talked a, a little bit about how, for the most part, um, the Congress has been essentially reacting to proposals that the department's putting forth as the fiscal environment continues to get more constrained. Do you see that holding, or is there likely to be more initiative on the part of the Congress? Um, and if so, what direction might that take? Uh, <clears throat> I'm not sure I have a good answer for that question. Uh, um, Congress typically is a reactive body. Congress ha has typically only intervened when they saw a crisis of some sort. Uh, Goldwater Nichols was a, was a result of years of me members watching unpleasant 
incongruities between forces, inability of Navy to talk to Marines on radios, uh, inability of Army to talk to Marines on radios, even though they bought the same or similar radios. Um, uh, I think things 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 will have to things will have to gestate for a while before Congress is going to b lean farther forward. Now that depends on what the department proposes. If the department proposes something that's radical, then I think that would that would probably engender that'd be a crisis. That'd be a crisis. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. All right. Let's open it up for questions. Anybody have any burning issues they want to raise to the panel? No. One over here, and then we'll go over here. Mr. Secretary, you have any questions? <laughs> it's Neil Desai, U.S. Marine Corps. Mr. Green, in addition to the uh, point you just mentioned that uh, the independent panel critiqued the QDR for uh, not looking forward enough, uh, they also, in their preliminary testimony, critiqued the fact that all the recommendations were made in a constrained environment, and the legislation for the QDR actually specifies uh, making recommendations in an unconstrained environment. Given that everyone has just mentioned the fiscal realities, do you believe in the next QDR, Congress will uh, amend that, that legislation and call for recommendations that are in a constrained environment? I don't know. I think um, I think they, they also the uh, independent panel also called for abolishing the QDR as we know it now. Uh, so I think the, co the, the Congress, the committee, committees are probably going to have to think about those recommendations and, and what, if any, action to take on that. I, at this point, I could not predict what uh, is likely to happen. I think this, this is the first independent panel that's sort of called for abolishing the QDR, though. That, that's, that's sort of a revolutionary or, or a kink in the system that <laughs> the members will have to deal with. Pat? Pat Tal, Pat Tal, Congressional Research Service. Uh, Bob's first uh, of his six uh, characteristics was the, we're going to go back to the naval character, and you mentioned the, uh, you mentioned the joint high-speed vessels and the, uh, the LSCs, or the LCSs. Uh, and, and that got me into wondering why we continue to focus just on, on the big gators, the, you know, the, the, the big decks and the, the LPDs and the LSDs. Is there any thought that, that you could think about the amphibious fleet? You know, we're going to have these smaller high speed, and they're, they're just big trucks, and if you could induce someone to build a force provider you know, to stick inside them, you could presumably haul Marines, and it could address some of the more distributed kinds of operations that you're talking about, you know, enhanced companies and the like. Is there, are, are we, have we been talking about too, too narrowly bounded a box here? Is there, is there not actually a bigger, broader amphibious force out there that, that we're in fact buying, whether we're thinking about it? Uh, I, I agree with you. And uh, that's one of the things, uh, over a year ago, we started uh, as the Navy was working through the LCS design construct was the creation of a, a module that would help uh, with the uh, with us being able to do some of the lower uh, end levels of engagement, so once the LCS program uh, uh, settles here in the in the near future, I think that talk needs to continue. So we are working with that. But the other part is also the MPS ships. Uh, everybody thinks that the MPS ships are floating warehouses. They're a lot more than that. And uh, if you take a look at the usage of the MPS ships over the past 20 years. Uh, they've been used in engagement operations around around the world, so they're they're another they're another now sea-based force that doesn't impinge on a nation's sovereignty, and does those engagement that creates those relationships that enable access. That's why we're re we're in the middle of trying to reconfigure our MPS to make them more relevant across the the range of oper of operations, whether it be engagement, humanitarian assistance, or disaster relief. The ability to do selective offload and at sea transfer is a game changer for the for the MPS. It creates your port at sea, but the other piece of that it allows you to get those ships involved in the in the lesser uh, in in the lesser uh, forms of engagement. We're in a in a fiscally demanding environment. You have to get you have to get two furs and three furs out of everything you buy, and that's what we're trying to say that you get out of the Marine Corps out and out of the out of the uh, the Navy Marine Corps team, 
you know, that when, when I talked about the operations in Haiti, you know, there was a three for there. You had a combat force. You know, it was organized, trained, and equipped to do all that. And there's not many forces that can do that that easily and, and, and uh, go across the spectrum of conflict with that ease. That's, that's a reflection of organizational agility. It's a reflection of, of having a properly trained force. And it's a reflection of that when we buy equipment, we buy it with the eye that it has to have utility across the range of military operations. Um, Dakota, I wanted to ask you if you, to follow on to that question, whether you see other opportunities for two furs or three furs or, um, or whether you think there are areas where the Marine Corps needs to give consider serious consideration to cutting back. Well, I think that's one of the great aspects of, of the Marine Corps is it's a general purpose force. And, and as, uh, as Mr. Work and the General has talked about, um, this broad utility where you can put a Marine and his kit in just about any situation and they're not overly specialized to the point where they can't respond to a certain environment. So the idea of, of taking smaller Marine detachments and putting them on LCSs or other platforms I think is a very good one that needs to be pursued. Obviously you have to have a platform actually in the water you know, to experiment and practice and rehearse and see what the art of the possible is. Um, there is always a, a limiting factor, though, uh, that's either a limiter or it's an enabler uh, when you look at the size of the box that you're dealing with. So I could take a platoon of Marines and put them on a frigate, but if they don't have helicopters and the equipment and fire support, they're not really much good other than as a shore patrol when the sailors you know, go into a, a, a Liberty port. Um, so if you look at LPD-17 or you look at the uh, littoral combat ship or any of these other platforms, you really have to carefully match the capability of the unit embarked with the kind of mission that you expect it to do uh, in any given set of circumstances. And again, absent the platform itself, most of these are just thought exercises. Uh, I think the, the folks at Quantico are thinking through that. Uh, but the proof is in the pudding, you know, as they say, and, and uh, the development of modern-day amphibious warfare capabilities uh, extended over many years uh, with the Calibri series of experiments, et cetera. And it's going to take a while to, to figure out what that really means. But I think the approach being taken intellectually right now is the right one. Okay. Um, uh, sorry, we'll, we'll go back there first and then come up here. Timothy Walton with Delix Consulting Studies and Analysis. Um, I think all of you have been taking a strong look at rising personnel costs across the services, but especially in the more manpower intensive ones of the Army and the Marine Corps. Um, Mr. Green, the independent uh, QDR recommended a Gates Commission style new commission to take a look at manpower costs, TRICARE in particular. How would you think Congress would go about doing that? And uh, maybe General, how would you support such efforts? Well, I've, I've been in Congress for a while, but I wasn't here when the original Gates Commission was founded in 1969. So um, I'm not sure I, I, I know I can map out exactly how that would take place. Uh, I think the, you know, the, the independent panel redu re uh, released its findings less than a week ago. And uh, I think the members are, are, you know, are likely to take that under advisement. I know enough from a number of sources they've heard and they realize that manpower costs are are uh, a growing um, uh, component of the budget and are pressing against other investment priorities um, I, at this point I can't I couldn't lay out a, a roadmap of okay there's going to be a gates like commission in the FY 12 bill or FY 11 amendment on the floor when the Senate can considers the DOD bill. Uh, I, I, I couldn't give you that specificity, but I certainly, I think they, um, they certainly are listening closely to what the independent panel had to say. I, I think the, the real challenge as you uh, try to capture uh, the way ahead on manpower cost is you, you, you have to realize that the current system uh, is designed to support the all volunteer force. And, that, and that's, a, that's a key part of this. And it's been a force that's been engaged in combat for seven years, which has contributed uh, to those increased manpower costs. All the services, uh, well, both land forces for sure have grown in strength to be able to support uh, you know, extended combat operations over seven years. So 
uh, when that situation changes, those costs will come down that way, but uh, the details of what is needed to support uh, an all-volunteer force clearly is something that uh, a high-level commission would have to take a look at. Okay, let's go over here. Bill Sweetman again, Defense Technology International. Um, question for uh, Dakota Wood. Um, you talked about uh, your concern that the current program is, is untenable. Um, what sort of magnitude of changes need to be made to make it, uh, to, to, to render it tenable? Um, does, do, do you need to take out elements from the force or do you need to s just scale back certain programs? The Marine Corps' baseline budget has doubled uh, in the last decade, since about 1990. I think it went from 12 and a half billion or so to now it's currently 26 billion. And then you add on top of that about $7 billion in supplemental funding. So in, in 10 years to double your budget, that's a pretty extraordinary thing. Uh, the country is faced with $13 trillion in federal deficits, and there's something like $50 trillion in unfunded um, entitlement programs just across the, the country. And, and I just can't imagine that that isn't going to have a ripple effect on expenditures in, in all areas, and the Defense Department will have to suffer some kind of cutback. Uh, Secretary Gates has already levied um, cuts of, what was it, $100 billion or something like that, uh, reduction in staffs, uh, trying to get the acquisition house in order. Uh, and so the Department of the Navy and then the Marine Corps specifically um, is going to feel those waves as they ripple out from, from that uh, stone cast into the pond. Um, I think the Marine Corps is also dealing with a reset bill, last I heard of it, of something like $16 billion to repair or replace equipment. And then we've talked about the all-volunteer force, and I don't have a specific dollar figure with me at the moment. It's something like 60% of the baseline budget. But with a plus up of 27,000 Marines um, to bring it to 202K, um, I just don't see how you can sustain that level of force in this fiscal environment. So I think it will be a combination of factors where um, a current plan for vehicles is three times uh, the cost of what has been historically the average going back to the 1980s. Uh, 202K, I think, will have to uh, be scaled back to uh, maybe 175 or lower just because of the cost of manpower and salaries and benefits and medical expenditures and building and all the things that come with, you know, maintaining uh, this particular individual at a competitive salary. Uh, so manpower, uh, getting their house in order in terms of the vehicle strategy, which the general has already talked about. And then there's the extraordinary costs associated with individual platforms, like the MV-22 or the F-35 Bravo or the EFE or the Marine Personnel Carrier or even the JLTV. Uh, the JLTV is a good example of a struggle that both the Army and the Marine Corps are, are having. The Marine Corps plans to buy somewhere around 5,500 of them uh, and you're going from $150,000 to 200K Humvee to a $500,000 JLTV is some of the last estimates that I've heard. Uh, the EFV is $22 million a copy. So it's just going to be a challenge uh, reconciling um, how expensive the force will be in this environment. And then if I end up taking cuts in certain increments, keeping the force balanced will probably see a reduction in the number of battalions and supporting units. And then the equipment density list that's already been discussed will have to be scaled back um, in, in, you know, in corresponding measure. Okay, any more questions out there? We've got one over here. General Flynn, hi, George Nicholson, independent policy consultant. Reference the LCS two years ago at the Surface Navy Association, Congressman Gene Taylor got up and he briefed as much as we're paying for ships, as much as we're paying for aircraft, we've got to build a uh, a growth capability into it. The two LCS variants right now, uh, after he spoke the next day, they had a panel with Admiral Sullivan, the PEO ships, Admiral Hamilton. I asked them about the LCS. I said, you've got one variant that's got a deck that's almost twice the size of the other. Potentially, it's got the capability of handling a V-22 or, or a 53 kilo, not to embark on it, but to provide resupply and everything else. And he said, that was never in the requirement. That's not going to be in our in our decision process when we make a down selection. Comments? Um, I, when, the, when the 
the LCS was uh, originally designed, it was designed to be able to do three tasks, uh, anti-surface warfare, uh, uh, mine countermeasures, and uh, anti-submarine warfare. So when the, when the concept, we weren't a part of that design. Uh, we're at the table now, as they, as they worked for the design, saying, okay, what could you do to, to this ship, and how could we work together to, to get some more utility out of it? So we are working with the Navy, but I, 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 I know that I need to stay in my lane, and that Navy ship construction. I did take a class on naval architecture once, and I passed, but uh, it's not my forte. Okay, well, let me uh, commend everybody for your patience and your stamina for sticking with us. Thank you very much, Secretary Work, for your time this morning or this afternoon. Uh, I wanted to close with one brief uh, recap of some comments that General Brute Kulak, the elder, made, um, I think, back in 1957 to show that, that we also, there are some things that don't change. Uh, this question of why are Marine Corps and General Kulak had three answers to that question. Um, of what the nation wants from the Marine Corps. First, they believe that when troubles come to our country, there will be Marines uh, ready to do something useful about it and do it at once. Second, they believe that when Marines go to war, they invariably turn in a performance that's dramatically and decisively successful, uh, not most of the time, but always. And third, that the Marines are masters of a form of unfailing alchemy, which converts unoriented youths into proud, self-reliant, and stable citizens. Congratulations. Congratulations. <laughs> Um, which <laughs> so uh, in any case, the, these questions of why Marine Corps, again, not new, um, but I think we've heard a great discussion today of what the future of the Marine Corps looks like, and we appreciate everybody for coming and participating with us. Thank you. Thank you, Doctor. Thank you.